everybody. Welcome to Help Wanted. This is a job interview style candidate forum designed to help you, the voters, decide who should work for you in the U.S. Senate. My name is Suzanne Murphy. I'm from WMPG, Southern Maine Community Radio from USM. And on behalf of the Maine League of Young Voters, we thank you all very much for coming. Tonight we are very pleased to learn more about the four Democratic candidates running for their party's nomination for U.S. Senate, and we are pleased to help voters make the best decision on primary day, June 12th. Now, you may notice that there are a few people missing from the stage this evening. We made a hard push to get the Republican primary candidates to the stage, but all of them turned down our request to speak with our community tonight. Unenrolled candidates running for the Senate were not invited because they will not face a primary. So this is, this is geared toward the primary, which again, June 12th, write that down. Let's meet the people behind tonight's event. The League of Young Voters Election Committee researches and interviews all candidates running for office to help voters make the most sound decision on election day. This year's election committee includes Emma Palas O'Connor, who is the chair, Patrick Banks, Wells Lyons, Eric Poulin, Zach Ankers, Pat Roche, Steve Berry, Gabby Pierce, Misha Swinton, and Kayalani Anderson Andre. They've collected candidate questionnaires, they've conducted follow up interviews, and then they've generated many of tonight's questions. Let's give them a round of applause for all the work they've done. tonight, Lucid Stage, our host for the evening, WMPG, Southern Maine Community Radio from USM. Lisa Bunker is recording tonight's uh, forum for WMPG. It will be aired tomorrow, 8.30 to 10 a.m. and 8.30 to 10 p.m. on WMPG 90.9, 104.1. Another co-sponsor who's also taping tonight, Community Television Network. Brian Knobloch is recording tonight's debate for airing on CTN sometime within a week or so. We don't have a definite date on that. Our also co-sponsoring tonight are the Maine People's Alliance, Southern Maine Workers Center, Southern Maine Community College Political Science Club, Think Tank, Maine's Majority PAC, the University Neighborhood Association, and the West End Neighborhood Association. We'd also like to thank the following organizations for contributing questions to tonight's forum. The Bicycle Coalition of Maine, and Maine Citizens for Clean Elections. We'll have our candidates introduce themselves in just a few minutes. But first off, let's review our format for this evening's job interviews. The event set up will feature an interview area here on stage. I will direct questions from over here on the side, and I will call candidates up to the mic at certain points when it is their turn. The forum will be divided into three rounds, each of which is designed to allow you to compare candidates in different ways. You can submit, sub excuse me, you can submit specific questions for any candidates by, by writing those questions on a piece of paper at the beginning of the forum, or by tweeting at Main League during the forum as the rounds unfold. All candidates will be allowed 90 seconds to introduce themselves at the start of the intro round, and 90 seconds to answer each question in every round. Gabby from the Elections Committee will be keeping time and indicating to candidates from off stage using color-coded lights. Right here. <laughs> <Stop>. <laughs> Candidate order has been selected at random prior to the event and will be as follows. Benjamin Pollard, Matthew Dunlap, Cynthia Dill, and John Hink. Please note that after our program is over, we will have time for candidates to speak directly with audience members and to conduct a ranked choice voting straw poll based on who you think had the best performance of the evening. We will announce the winner this evening approximately 20 minutes after the end of the program, so stick around. Okay. You guys ready? Let's, let's jump into round one. 
We will begin tonight's forum with the introductions of the candidates and a hypothetical scenario question drafted by the Elections Committee to show the candidates' decision-making processes and the principles that they would apply to the job in Washington. For the introductions, we are going to literally put candidates on the spot by having them come up here and stand in these bright lights. So bright enough over there, we can stand, come up here one at a time, next to me. Uh, our first, our first candidate, we will turn to Benjamin Pollard. Mr. Pollard, could you please come up and stand by this microphone? In 90 seconds, please uh, introduce yourself to the audience by stating the town you currently live in, your occupation, and what one of your five-year goals as a U.S. Senator would be. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Benjamin Pollard, and I am the president of an ecologically sustainable construction company. I grew up in Blue Hill, and I currently live in Portland. Within five years, I would like to have served in a leadership role of a movement of the citizens of the earth, in which all of us will have worked together to have eradicated hunger worldwide, created the universal nuclear disarmament, and the abolition of the nuclear power industry, reversed the increase of carbon dioxide emissions into the atmosphere, protected the Earth's remaining biological diversity, and created peaceful resolution to the conflicts between Israel and Palestine, India and Pakistan, and China and Tibet, and ended other major violent conflicts around the world as well. While these goals are admittedly ambitious, I believe that today we are at a turning point in the history in history of the utmost importance, and that we face a choice between creating a transition to a culture of peace and ecological sustainability, or continuing down a path of economic and ecological collapse, which combined with the existence and proliferation of nuclear weapons, could result in the destruction of human civilization and most forms of life on Earth. I hope you will join me in making the bright future, which I know is ahead of us, into a reality. Part to your intro here. Thanks. We're getting rolling here. They'll learn from you. Okay. <laughs> All right, here's your hypothetical scenario once you are in the Senate. Uh, you are working with other senators to craft legislation. <laughs> um, craft the legislation intended to create jobs. Which of the following proposals would you advocate to include? Please respond with either A, B, or C, and why. A, reduce the corporate tax rate. B, reduce workplace safety regulations. C, pass federal stimulus legislation similar to the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act. Which one of those would you put into uh, crafting legislation intended to create jobs? All right, so uh, we have, I have a limited menu of options here, so I'm choosing multiple choice. The one that's closest yes. to my answer is C. Um, I do believe we need to invest in infrastructure. Um, we have roads and bridges which are collapsing. We need high-speed internet around the country. I believe that with the higher cost of petroleum, we need to invest in a rail network around the nation, both standard rail and high-speed rail. I actually just got back from England, and it's delightful to be driving on the trains. I enjoy it very much, and it's, and it's a great way to save uh, petroleum, uh, conserve petroleum. Um, I think, in addition, if I could expand upon you know, the similarity to that job act, I do think we do need to reduce the regulatory burden which is facing corporations. And as a small business owner, I'm very aware that it's very challenging to provide employment opportunities. The Economist magazine had a cover story a few weeks ago called Overregulated America, which talked about um, just how, uh, how cumbersome the regulations are. So we need to achieve goals. We need legislation which is simple and concise and logical and easy to comply with while achieving the basic goals. I think we also need to invest in education and job training. I think there's an opportunity for volunteerism among Americans to help teach basic skills such as literacy as well as more advanced job skills. Thank you. Uh, there's also a follow-up the Southern Maine Workers Center wanted to ask to, uh, what your answer was there. So their question is, how does your response promote worker dignity and a just economy? Um, so, 
I think it's critical that workers take pride in what we do and have dignity and are treated well and, and, and respectfully. Um, I'm both the worker, I'm at this point the worker of, of the company, I'm a carpenter and a mason. And, and, um, I think providing education opportunities, one thing I should say, I think one of the best ways to reform the education system is to repeal the No Child Left Behind Act. And, and the, the federal standards and regulations really impede the ability of teachers to be creative in the classroom and to do what really is an art form, which is bringing students to love the uh, learning, uh, to the act of learning, the idea of learning. Um, so I think a lot of education investment should be done at the state and local level, um, but that um, really providing meaningful work in the construction trades, another thing I think we should do in terms of job stimulus is invest in energy efficient remodeling of our housing stock and commercial buildings, and that both creates jobs, it also reduces our carbon dioxide emissions and saves people money. Um, so I think that's a real winner as far as job stimulus. And, and by going along with uh, living wage, uh, increasing wages to a standard where people can live at a decent standard uh, of living, um, I think we can increase the dignity of workers. Thank you very much. You can be opportunities to serve as a state representative and as Secretary of State. In five years, what I hope to be doing is be back here and talking with you again about the same types of conversations that we've had this year around generating a better economy, a better, uh, better future with greater prosperity than what we have seen in the last decade, and perhaps platform a new campaign to build on those successes around things like job prosperity, uh, student debt, um, protecting our environment, tax fairness, a better health care system than what we're facing right now, all the things that I've heard about over the last few months that hopefully we'll, be, we'll have crafted some solutions to that we can further develop uh, success for the five, six years after that. Thank you. All right, um, Mr. Dunlap, your, your hypothetical scenario question is, a Republican majority in Congress under a Republican president is planning to introduce a bill to repeal the Affordable Care Act. Democrats plan to filibuster the bill. In the meantime, bipartisan legislation which would end the filibuster is up for a vote. Would you vote to end the filibuster, eliminating the option of filibustering the repeal of the Affordable Care Act? Please answer yes or no and explain. Would I vote to end the filibuster? Um, I would not vote to end the filibuster because it is a valuable tool to give the minority some say in how legislation is crafted. As far as the Affordable, Affordable Care Act would be affected by that, I believe that no one bill can solve all of our problems in any case. And I think there's a lot more that has to be done with health care, regardless of what happens under the current scenario now with the Supreme Court pending decision on the Affordable Care Act or some other iteration of legislation that comes forward. I do believe there has to be some reform to the filibuster rules, um, but to simply end the filibuster would then give no one the voice that they would need, especially if we were serving in a minority party with, a, with, a, uh, with the other party's uh, nominee as the president. Uh, I think ending the filibuster at that juncture would probably be working against ourselves in that, in that longer term scope. Great. And as a follow-up to that, Think Tank, a local small business in Portland, wants to know what legislative measures you will support as a U.S. Senator to make health care affordable for small businesses. What can you do to make local co-ops a more viable option, for instance? Well, I think local co-ops are just one of many proposals that we need to introduce and, and discuss. But what we really need to do with health care is everything that we discuss about health care has to be considered as part of the greater solution or the greater problem. 
we treat so many things as if they're not part of the, the, the problems that have created such high uh, health care costs, high insurance costs. We also have to make sure that whatever system we put in place also makes the healthcare field an attractive one for people to get into the healthcare profession. Right now, we just create a system of high paid bureaucrats who we used to call doctors and nurses. I think that a program like a, co a health co op is something that's incredibly important. But one of the things I've discovered in this discussion about healthcare is that when we talk about containing costs, what we are not saying that the real reason why people don't want to see cost contained is because their profits be cut. So I think we have to address this from, a, from an integrated approach from both the delivery side, the insurance side, and with an eye towards providing excellent health care for the patient so the patient doesn't have to worry about going bankrupt because he gets sick. That's got to be our goal in the long term. Okay. Thank you. Matthew Dunlap. Okay. 
Um, thanks to Lucid Stage, WMPG, and to the League of Young Voters, who um, I liked as the League of Pissed Off Voters. <laughs> they're as good as ever. Uh, my name is John Hank. I am a uh, uh, state legislator. I'm a lawyer representing uh, consumers, investors, uh, environmental interests, in complex litigation. I'm uh, Juliet's husband and Darcy's dad. Uh, I do some homework, I mean uh, housework, and uh, I do more buying food and cooking. Uh, what other part of that? What is uh, one of your goals if you were elected to the U.S. Senate and that you want to accomplish in your basically the first five years of the six-year term? Uh, it's going to be a trial of fire for any senator. At the end of this year, uh, the Bush tax cuts are set to expire. And at the same time, because uh, the Senate and Congress didn't reach agreement on budget, uh, we have a whole bunch of uh, fixed uh, uh, budget cuts that are going to go in uh, if something isn't done. Uh, I would like to be part of that discussion. I think too often it's been dominated by big money, vested interests. I think we need more senators that are focused on the interests of ordinary working people. I'd like to be part of that. I'd like to see that our tax system is fairer. I would like to see that we move toward uh, balancing the budget, but not on the backs of the middle class, as we've done in the past, and instead do it in a way that's fair. All right, now here is your scenario question, hypothetical scenario, once, once I'm, you're elected. You're I'm ready? afraid of this one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen okay. what's going on, I couldn't answer any of them. <laughs> a bill is up for, for the vote that would create a federal mandate on clean energy. The bill would require that half of all energy production in the U.S. Derived, would be derived from renewable energy sources. But there's also a requirement that at least 20% of the energy must come from nuclear sources. How would you vote, yay or nay, and why? Well, I have to tell you that that bill would not uh, match my vision for our energy future. It seems to be the highest priority that we should be focusing on is energy efficiency. Uh, I think that uh, government, the national government should be leading the way in pushing energy efficiency. Uh, renewable energy is certainly useful. Uh, I frequently support it. Uh, um, I don't think that we have to ban nuclear power. I do think if we made it pay its own cost, if we internalized the cost of bad power, it wouldn't be competitive. Uh, for example, years ago, it was given an exemption, the Price-Anderson Act, from insuring themselves in the event of a catastrophic accident. That's a subsidy. We should take it away. Uh, so if we made some market changes, it wouldn't matter whether we passed that bill or not, but I think in the form you described it, I'd propose it. Okay. And as a follow-up uh, to that, uh, considering the validity of climate change is still challenged on the floor of the U.S. Senate, how will you shape the debate in Washington to pass comprehensive climate change legislation? Um, certainly that legislation is critical. I've already uh, lobbied uh, Congress, including the U.S. Senate, on energy climate legislation. I was part of uh, legislators around the country that came together to try and get it passed a couple of years ago. And, uh, you know, there was a possibility of getting something passed that was decent. We came very, very close. Uh, I would like to believe that we can make progress on those priorities. It is going to be difficult getting it past the climate deniers. Uh, I've gotten very used to pushing progress in the energy area without putting that issue in people's face. I don't think we should deny it. Climate is a huge problem. Uh, Human-induced climate change is a huge problem. But if some people can't tolerate that discussion, let's move forward on the energy agenda uh, without uh, forcing them to back down. I'm afraid we can't change the nature of the Senate overnight, but we can make progress. Thank you very much, John. Thank you.